Hello everyone, this is Alison Gross and welcome to my very first episode of Drunk Literature. As you can see, I am really drunk. Yes, I am drinking cider right now. This is my fourth bottle. I know that doesn't seem like I'm like that much, but I am a total lightweight, so this totally has me really, really drunk. And it's like 2 a.m. in the morning here, which is not the kind of time that I'm normally awake. I'm normally asleep, but I had a bad day today, and I got really stressed out, so I figured I'd get drunk, and then when I'm like, I'm drunk, so I'm not gonna record, like, I need to record shit, because I don't like being... Well, I kind of do like being drunk, but it's a bad idea because it's like so many calories. This is like over a thousand calories right here. Boo, and I'm probably going to eat some pizza afterwards because a friend of my roommate told me there's this thing called the drunchies, which is like the drunk munchies, which happens to me a lot. So it all kind of really sucks like that. But anyway, so we're going to read some literature, and then we're going to talk about it. We're going to pretend like we're in class, and it's all going to be totally professional and shit. And yeah. Okay, so to start out with, we're not doing medieval and stuff, even though most of the stuff we're going to be doing here is medieval. But we're going to do something Victorian and stuff. Dead, cause like, yeah. Okay, so here's how this is gonna go down. I'm gonna read the poem. Yeah, and then we're gonna talk about it, cause that's what happens in a literature class. Oh yeah. So, poem number one for drunk literature is called My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. Robert Browning is kind of a romantic dude because he, like, married Elizabeth Bat. He, like, rescued her and shit. And he wrote a really romantic poem about being reunited with her when he died. And there's like this wax cast when I was in grad school. They told me about how there's this wax cast of their hands together like this. And it's supposed to be really romantic. Except that, that after she died, he proposed to a bunch of other women, which just kind of ruins it. I was really sad when I found out about that. But anyway, Robert Browning, one of the most famous poets of the Victorian era. The other one was Alfred Lord Tennyson. We'll probably read some of his shit later. Yeah. Anyway, so Robert Browning wrote this poem called My Last Duchess. And here's how it goes down. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive, I call. The piece of wonder now, Fra Pandolf's hands, Worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you sit and look at her? I said, Fra Pandolf by design, for never read. Strangers like you, this peace countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turn, since none puts by. The curtain I have drawn for you, but I am seemed as they would ask me if they durst. As such a glance came there, so not to the first, as you to turn and ask this, sir, twas not. Her husband's presence only that called that spot, spot on this side. I have to remember that it is mirrored in this thing that I can see. If joy unto the Duchess's cheek, perhaps Fra Panov chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint can never hope to reproduce that 
faint half flush that dies upon her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say it, too soon made glad. Too easily impressed, she liked what air she saw. And she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, it was all one, my favor at her breast. The dropping of the daylight in the west. The bow of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. The white mule she rode on round the terrace, all in each, would draw from her alike the approving speech. A oh, blush, blush at this side it's mirrored, blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked. Somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900-year-old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame? This sort of trifling even had you the skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that and you disgusts me. Here you miss, or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands. Then all smiles stuck together. There she stands, looking as if alive. Will please you rise? We'll meet the company below. Then I repeat, the culture master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretence of mine for dowry. Will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I vowed. At starting is my object, nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune through the taming a seahorse, though a rarity, which Klaus of Eisenberg cast in bronze for me. Yeah, that's the poem. Now we'll talk about This poem is what literature courses like to use as the prime example of what is called a dramatic monologue. Oh, I just made a rhyming poem there and I didn't even intend to. Wow, I am so with you when I'm drunk. Ow, I just hit my teeth with a bottle and... Oh yeah, Forney is maybe joining us later. He's having dinner right now. The nerve of it. Why is he eating? He doesn't need to eat. Anyway. So yes, dramatic monologue. This means a poem in which the speaker, and by the way, never make the mistake of confusing the speaker with the author. This makes literature instructors very angry. Don't do that. Anyway. This is a poem where the speaker addresses a silent listener. This makes it a monologue because there is only one voice speaking. But it is a dramatic monologue because there are two people present, like in a drama. You see how this works. Anyway, so in this case, the dramatic monologue, the drama, is between the Duke of Ferraria who is the one speaking the poem, and the ambassador from somewhere else. I don't know where he's from, and from somewhere else. This ambassador has arrived, negotiated the marriage of his master's daughter to the Duke of Ferraria. But this ambassador doesn't get to talk much because the Duke is kind of an asshole and monopolizes the conversation. This is why it's a dramatic monologue, because the Duke is talking, and the other dude just has to sit there and listen to him. 
not very cool for the other dude. So that's how a dramatic monologue works. Anyway, when you take a literature course and they teach you about dramatic monologue, they almost always use this poem as an illustration of it. This is what I do in my courses too. I use this poem as an illustration of it. Because this is a quintessential dramatic monologue. I don't even know if there are any other dramatic monologues. They are just like this poem and we never learn about any of the other ones. Anyway, that's not important. The important thing is, it is a dramatic monologue. Yes. So, so what's going on, as I've told you, is that this ambassador dude is going to negotiate the marriage of his best daughter to the Duke of Ferraria. So Duke of Ferraria, unfortunately, as you've seen in the poem, my last duchess, means that the Duke was married previously to a duchess. So it was his last duchess because it was the duchess he had most recently before this girl that he's about to marry to make her his next duchess. At least that's what he's trying to negotiate for. So, the thing is... The last duchess, so we are finding out about her. Most of you would think this is probably a horribly non-PC faux pas that he's talking about his previous wife while he's trying to negotiate for marrying his next wife. And I need to drink more soda, but I really hope I don't crunk my teeth this time because it was kind of painful. It still hurts right now. So, the thing is... So this dramatic monologue, it's everything he's telling to the ambassador about his previous wife. So why the fuck is he talking about his previous wife when he's trying to negotiate? Basically because he was pissed at his previous wife. And he wants to make it clear to the ambassador that his new wife isn't going to have any shit like that. Um, my chin is really itchy. I had electrolysis for the first time in like two months today. It kind of hurts. Yeah, actually it doesn't really hurt, but it's kind of itchy. But I shouldn't touch it because it's... Like, I can damage the skin if I touch it, so it's itchy, but I can't touch it, itchy, but I can't eat it. You get the idea. I don't know why, but I'm assuming Fournier is eating hot dogs right now, because some, usually when he goes to dinner, it's hot dogs, or Frankfurt, as he calls them, or maybe Frankfurters are the, like, elitist thing. Like, because he's German, so he's, like, all this, like, fancy German food shit. Um... <laughs> Dude, you're like listening to me and <sighs> not fair, dude. Um, yeah, so Fordy's just laughing at me now because I'm talking about how like so apparently like Frankfurters and hot dogs are not the same thing in Germany and Frankfurters are much higher class than hot dogs. Yeah. Whatever. But it's better. Yeah, because yeah, everything German is better. Germans only like fucking meat, okay? So, therefore they suck. Anyway. Oh, except for Black Forest Cake. Black Forest Cake is awesome. We're not going to talk about sauerkraut. It's disgusting. Okay, pretzels are also awesome. Or at least pretzel buns are awesome. My roommate has been promising me that we're going to make sloppy joes, and I bought some pretzel buns special for it, except that that's even better. So there are some cool things about Germany, but essentially Germany is overly meat-focused. Okay, we're not talking about German food right now. I need to get back to talking about literature. Talking about literature. Quiet. What? Yeah. Okay. So. You have no idea how fucking drunk I am right now. You, you really have no idea. Anyway. Okay. So. Duke is negotiating. So he's basically what he's doing is he's talking about his previous wife to tell the ambassador dude. Okay. This is everything I didn't like about my previous wife. So you need to make sure that my new wife doesn't have any of these issues because otherwise we're gonna have the same problem we had last time. I, 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 I'm gonna get to that. Uh, 
because the implication in the poem is that he had his previous wife executed because he says i gave commands all the smiles stopped together and most people read this to mean i basically had her beheaded because i'm a dick like henry the eighth anybody knows i really fucking hate henry the eighth and all the shit that he went down with his wives like it really fucked me up anyway so this 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 dude this duke of ferraria is kind of like that the implication being that he was pissed by his wife and so he had her killed and so basically he's saying dude tell your master that his daughter better not do any of this shit or i'm gonna have her killed Basically, that involves math, and I don't like math, so we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> I think you're right, but I'm not good enough with fractions to be absolutely certain you're right, especially when I'm drunk, okay? I'm really, really drunk right. Yes, he killed two out of six. I think that's one third. Three. What's your point? This is a literature lesson, not a math lesson. Stop trying to hijack the video. All my video belong to myself, not to you. Dude. I'm drunk. Don't hold me accountable. So... They... Okay, now talk about prosecutors. It's not funny right now, considering what shit already went down today. Um, so, like, the next question is, okay, so what exactly was the problem with his previous wife? So, one of the errors that a lot of people make, including a lot of my students, is that they think that the previous wife, like some of Henry VIII's wives, meaning the two that he had executed, either, like, actually cheated on him or was, like, a flirt. Okay, whatever. I think flirting is kind of cheating on somebody anyway, but whatever. Like, that either she, like, actually slept with other people or at least she flirted with people all the time. I don't think that's actually what the poem is saying. I'm about to get to that. Um, I gotta look this up again. I lost my page. Damn it. Ooh, an ad for heels. Skyscraper heels. Ooh. Yeah, I need to make some shoe videos. That, that, would, that would be cool. I'm too far back. There is no shoe literature. It's sad. Okay, wrong wrong time period. Romantic period. We're going to Victorians. Okay. We're going to Victorians. Okay, so. No, I don't mean you. The, the other Victorians. The sexually repressed Victorians. Your degree of sexual repression or lack thereof is not really a subject for a public YouTube video. I would be bad from YouTube if I discussed that. Okay, so we're not going to do that. Yes. Okay, I'm not, at least not in this video, getting into the intricacies of Victorian sexuality. I have read books about that. But we're not going to get into that here. That's not relevant to this poem. Okay, not relevant. Okay, so the passage. Um, well, there's several different pa What is this shit on my skirt? It says, All in each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. She thanked men good, but thanked somehow I knew not as if she ranked my gift of a 900-year-old name with anybody's gift. Basically, so it's not that she is really sounds like what okay so just videos 
it, viewers, viewers, viewers. So, for use's purpose here is as the uneducated, non-literary person to show his view of not understanding what the fuck I'm saying so that I can translate it into layman's terms because Fadius is not a priest. Which is kind of too bad, but whatever. So you're saying it sounds like she is flirting? Is that what you're trying to say? Why does it sound like she's doing more than flirting? No, it said. All and each would draw from her like the approving speech or blush at least. She thanked men good, but thanked somehow I know not as if she ranked my gift of a 900 year old name with anybody's gift. Okay, whatever. I know you have a dirty mind. And most of literature is about sex, but we need to be judicious here. So my, my interpretation of what the... Okay, yeah, actually, yeah. That might be it, that she's receiving flirts or c compliments or whatever. Like, basically, the thing is that she's she's kind of, like, happy about everything. Like, there's the line from when I read the poem about how she likes riding her mule around and she likes eating cherries and everything, and that makes her just as happy as the fact that this duke married her, basically. Basically, the gist of the poem is the duke is kind of a fucking self-centered egomaniac. And he thinks that he's the shit. And that therefore, like, everybody should be totally an... No, the shit, not shit. That everybody should be in awe of him because he's the shit. And so he thinks... Now, given that this is a dramatic monologue, and it's from the Duke's point of view, we don't really know, like... And this is kind of the thing about a lot of poems and why poetry interpretation is difficult for some students is because, damn it, why is my liquor all over my computer and my desk and everything? This always happens when I'm drunk. That one of the things that poems do is leave, like, it's called ellipses. They leave things out. We don't actually know who the last duchess was or what her family uh, background was or anything. So, we don't actually know what her social class vis-a-vis -vis the Duke was or anything like that. We have to assume that the Duke thought she was of lower social class. And that, therefore, like, he feels like she should be really, like, grateful and everything that he deigned to marry her. Which is kind of the attitude that he's taking with the new ambassador for his wife, too. But anyway, he thinks she... Exactly. So the implication, because the characters in this poem, even though it was written in the Victorian era, the characters in this poem are from Renaissance Italy. And my literature book has this charming Renaissance painting in it of, like, some Renaissance lady... Yeah, see, Renaissance lady. Um, so, one of the things that was a big deal in Renaissance Italy, there was a nobility, but sometimes the nobility didn't have all of the moolah, and so they would marry merchants. There was this big growing merchant class during the Renaissance. And... Right, and they would marry into the nobility because the nobility had the 900-year-old name, but the merchants had the money, and they would get married. And so then the merchants would get noble blood in their bloodline, and that would be cool for them, and the nobility would get a fresh influx of cash, and that would be cool for them. 
And since this was a really popular thing in Renaissance Italy, I'm guessing the implication in the poem is that that's what happened with the last duchess. That she came from a family that was less prestigious in terms of lineage than the Duke, but that maybe it had more money or something. And the Duke is feeling kind of like he's got kind of a small penis in relative to this. He's kind of feeling like shitty about the money or something. And he feels like his whole like worth in life is his lineage. Because that's kind of how the nobility feels. So he's like... Exactly. So he's like, my wife has got to be totally like... In all of my lineage and act like I'm the shit because I've got this awesome lineage. And the previous, his previous wife totally didn't do that. Like, she... I mean... Exactly, she was happy about everything. Like, she liked... Right, she's happy about, like, eating cherries and riding her mule. And this is why I get kind of annoyed when students assume that she's, like, adulterous or something. Because riding her mule... It is not a euphemism. Most things in literature are euphemisms, but in this case, I'm pretty sure that riding the mule is not a euphemism. No, that's for guys. Okay. No. No. Don't make this more difficult than it is. No. No, 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 no. So, basically, the thing is that we get a perspective of how, like, incredibly insanely fucking arrogant the Duke is. Because he's like, dude, I want to marry your master's daughter. Let me tell you about how I killed my ex-wife and why I killed her so that the new wife that I'm getting from you doesn't do the same thing. I mean, who the fuck does that? Well, if you say so. It's, well, not entirely, because if aristocrats didn't have money, they couldn't always, like, have all the influence that they wanted to have, which is why they would marry into families that had money. But this is supposed to show how, like, totally arrogant the Duke is, because... He's like, dude, let me tell you about how I killed my ex-wife and when he's negotiating his next marriage. And the other thing is that the poem expresses how the Duke is kind of this total control freak. And we see this in the thing where he's like showing, so he's showing the portrait of his last duchess. Like, she had her portrait painted, which, by the way, is already showing that the Duke is this really like aristocrat who's very prestige oriented because only the richest people could have their portrait painted because that was kind of expensive so the mere fact that you're having portrait painting done is already a thing but what he says is none puts by the curtain here but I which so the first thing that it's saying because portraits were so valuable back in the day is that you wouldn't just leave them out like we would leave our portraits out because the sunlight could damage them. So they would have curtains over them. And you would have this sort of like rope thing that you would pull and it would open the curtain so you could see the portrait. And what the Duke is saying is that only I can pull the rope to open so you can see the portrait. So what he's saying is that even though she's dead, I still own my previous wife. Because I will not let anybody see her portrait except for me. None puts by the curtain but I. And so, so he, this is doing multiple things. First of all, he's saying, I'm a really prestigious dude because I have all this artwork. Look at how awesome my artwork is. Second of all, I own my artwork. Okay, no, it's... 
Yeah, kind of, except not because this artwork actually was like nice to look at. So it's not quite the same as modern art. Exactly. Yeah, the concept is still like, look at how cultured and sophisticated and rich I am because I can have this art in my house. So that's one of the things he's saying. And the second thing he's saying is, I control access to my art, just like I control access to everything else. I control access to my wife. And he was pissed because he wasn't able to control access to his wife because she was like nice to everybody. And he wanted her, so this is my interpretation is that it's not like she was just like flirting or having an affair or something. But the thing that pissed him off was that she was nice to everybody. She wasn't like aloof and like, I'm superior. Because he felt like she should act like she was superior because she was married to him and he's so superior. So therefore, if she has his 900 year old name, she's so much better than everybody else that she shouldn't interact with him. So, the other thing that we see with the Duke, an attempt for him to show like how prestigious and cool he is, is that he name drops. So he mentions the fact that Fra Pandolf painted the portrait of his wife. So one of the things, and Fra Pandolf shows up in other Renaissance um, poetry, I believe, so... Robert Browning, and we talked about Robert Browning earlier, he's kind of a master of the dramatic monologue. He does a lot of dramatic monologues, and I believe he did a dramatic monologue written from the point of view of Fra Pandolf, which involved Fra Pandolf being out, like, unattended on the streets late at night, and he gets, like, apprehended by these guards and shit. So, and I had to study this poem for my GRE test. The impression I got is that Fra Pandolf is kind of this. He's a Renaissance priest, so he's a friar, but he likes to paint ladies and stuff. So we know what that means. You know what painting ladies means? It means he likes. It means he likes to look at ladies. So, like, for instance, in my last touches, he... Yeah, but he's a fucking priest, okay? Mm. Okay, whatever, Mr. Catholic. My interpretation of Catholicism is different from yours, based on my study of the Middle Ages and all of that shit. Anyway, so... And, like... You know, it's just me, but, like, in this poem, he talks about how when Fra Pandolf is painting her, he says, Oh, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Like, my impression is that that's supposed to be some kind of suggestive statement. I haven't quite figured out exactly how that's supposed to be suggestive, but that's the impression I got. But anyway, so... Based on these other things that Robert Browning wrote, um, the impression is that he thinks that Fra Pandolf is this sort of really prestigious Renaissance painter. And so, like, even if he's kind of this um, debauched friar or whatever, he's still a fucking good painter. Based on the other stuff he's written. I don't know if that's actually true or not. It's just that I get the impression that that's what Robert Browning thinks. So when he has the Duke say, Fra Pandolf painted this picture, he's saying, hey, I got the best of the best to paint her. And then at the very end, he says, okay, we're going to go down and discuss the uh, nuts and bolts of the marriage treaty. By the way, look out the window and you'll see my bronze fountain uh, the Neptune taming the seahorses. By the way, that was made of made by Klaus of Eisenberg. So basically what we get from all of this is that the Duke likes the name drop. He's not just like, oh, hey, look at all this cool art I have. It's like, look at this art I have that's made by the most prestigious artists. And the other thing, 
No, no, no. It's not that the bronze is expensive. It's that apparently, or the implication of the poem, I've never heard of Klaus of Eisenberg except in this poem. I have heard of Fra Pandolf and other shit that Robert Browning has written, so I don't really know what he did other than what Robert Browning thought. But the implication is that Klaus of Eisenberg was a really great sculptor. So the thing is... Yeah, it, I'm assuming he used, like, lost wax method or something, where you'd, like, carve it out of wax, and then you put clay over the wax to make a mold of it, and then you pour hot metal into it. I'm assuming that's how it works. Well, how else are you supposed to do it? Are you, like, an expert sculptor or something? Okay, that sounds like fucking modern art. We're not going to talk about that. So the other... The thing is, so he... A lot of people have debated, okay, why the fuck is he... Like, randomly being like, oh, look outside and see my Neptune sculpture, blah, blah, blah. So, it's, first of all, it's talking about how he name drops. Because he's trying to show how cool he is. Because he's got a 900-year-old name, so he's got to be really cool. So, he's like, oh, yeah, look at how cool I am. I have all this art done by the best artists. But the other thing, by having this, the, I think it's like just like three or four lines at the end of the poem. This, like, sort of one-off thing. Oh, hey, look at this sculpture. If the implication is that he views that sculpture. You know, random sculpture outside. It's probably, like, a fountain or something. From some, like, random mythological thing. He views that on the same level as the portrait of his previous wife. That just like this sculpture is just a piece of art. His wife, his wife is just a piece of art. Exactly. And so what he's trying to do is show this, um, the ambassador, what he expects from a wife, which is essentially, the wife's duty is to make me look cool. Just like my art makes me look cool, the wife is supposed to make me look cool. Mm-hmm. He wants a trophy wife. And he's basically like, if I don't get a cool trophy wife, Yes. If I don't get a cool trophy wife, I'm going to kill her, is essentially what he's telling the ambassador. So, like, you better give me a good trophy wife who comes with good dowry. Oh, yeah, he has this, like, this really kind of obnoxious line. Where is it? Um, where he... He's kind of trying to hide the fact that he's just after money. Um, where he says, um, what is it? An ample warrant that no just pretense of mind for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. So he's like, oh, so you better give me whatever I want for the dowry. But it's really her I want. The dowry isn't the important thing. I want to marry her. But you better give me whatever I want for the dowry. Yeah. So that's essentially the gist of the poem. And... Well, right. The idea... Um, that's kind of what Robert Browning does, is he frequently does these dramatic monologue things where the person in them is kind of an asshole, where he does like this, one of his things that he write, wrote is called The Ring and the Book, where it's like, I don't even know how to describe it, I don't remember it entirely, but, so there's this, very similarly to this poem, there's this old dude who's married to this younger girl, 
And then, like, she's unhappy, and then this friar comes by, and she kind of... I am out of alcohol. She goes back... She escapes from... The... This guy lives out in the countryside. She escapes from his, his manor with the friar and goes back to the city. And then there's this horrible thing, and he thinks she's having an affair with the friar, and he gets really incensed and shows up at her parents' house and kills them, and then it's revealed that she's not really your parents' daughter, and blah, blah, blah. It's called The Ring in the Book, and it's a series of dramatic monologues, each from the perspective of different characters. There's one from the husband's point of view, one from the wife's point of view, one from the friar's point of view, from the one from the parents' point of view. There's one each for the two lawyers in the case's point of view. The lawyers' monologues get kind of dull, but anyway. Well, shut up about that. Uh... That's completely different. Where no, uh, apparently YouTube doesn't like when I talk about Lord of the Rings. But anyway, yeah, because I mentioned Lord of the Rings. Oh no, it's copyrighted. Oh God, what a horrifying thought. Uh, no, if Peter Jackson makes video, like makes movies in the sub early, and I'm going to be so upset. But my point here is that that like Robert Browning likes writing these dramatic monologues where he shows flawed individuals, even the one where he he writes from the perspective of Fra Pandolf. He shows these this flawed individual. He's going to like have a party in the licensed quarter, if you know what I mean, in this in this dramatic monologue. So this is what Robert Browning likes to do, so it's hardly surprising that he writes this dramatic monologue where there's this duke that's this flawed individual that is totally focused on his particular, like, prestige. Um, so, this poem is very important not only because it's the quintessential example of the dramatic monologue, but also because it's, it's very typical of the kind of shit that Robert Browning likes. And I don't mean that everything that Robert Browning likes writes his shit. He writes some good poems, but... My point is that, that that he likes this kind of stuff, and he likes writing about Renaissance Italy and everything, because the Ring in the Book is also... Ring in the Book is like the length of a novel or something, and yes, I have read the whole thing. Um, you want me to do a drink literature of it? The only way I'm going to do that is if somebody requests it on my Patreon page, because, yeah, that thing is kind of crazy. Uh, but... My point is that you can see similarities between that and this shorter poem that he's written. He likes to take... <clears throat> One of the things that they also talk about in literature classes a lot is how the Duke is sort of an example of Machiavellianism. It's apparently... And that the, the, the husband in Ring in the Book is also sort of supposed to be a Machiavellian figure. I personally am not so sure that this Duke is so Machiavellian because um, everybody seems to think that any sort of like semi-sadistic whatever figure from Renaissance Italy is Machiavellian. Machiavelli is actually very much about effective, <clears throat> effective government. And both... Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Because he, like, what he was really about was all about how to be an effective leader. And both the husband and the ring and the book. Well, 
Well, except that in, in reality, Machiavelli is like, oh, well, you should make them like you because them liking you makes you govern more effectively. He's, he's like, you know, you shouldn't worry about being virtuous if it's inefficient to be virtuous, but you should always make people think that you're virtuous because it's more efficient if they like you. Yeah, that, 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 well, right, that, that he's like, you know, okay, it's okay to be virtuous if it doesn't affair, interfere with the rest of your governing, but even if you have to do something that's unvirtuous in order for to, to effectively govern, you should still try to make it look like you're virtuous, virtuous to your constituency because they support you, and if they're, if they like you and they're being supportive of you, it's more efficient for you. But the thing is that both, like, the husband in The Ring and the Book and the husband in The Last Duchess, going around and, like, killing or prosecuting wives because they did something that you didn't like doesn't actually sound like the most effective government strategy. Um... It's not clear in Last Duchess, but like I said, my theory is that she came from a wealthy, though less, like, aristocracy, prestige family. And this is made very explicit in the ring of the book, and that's what's going on. And in both cases, you know, your in-laws have a lot of moolah. Um, it's not to your advantage to piss them off by murdering or abusing or otherwise, like, causing issues for their daughter. Even if you're, like, offended by her behavior or something, it behooves you to work things out with her in-laws because they have money and they can give you money and make you a more effective ruler because they have money for you. So I don't... Yes. I don't know if that issue is actually brought up in The Ring and the Book. It might be. I'm not sure. The Ring and the Book is really calm. But anyway, the, the thing is that even though people frequently portray the Duke in my last touch as a Machiavellian figure, I would say that he's kind of a fake Machiavellian figure. It's the, the latter meaning of Machiavelli of over the years Machiavellian has come to mean this kind of like totally ruthless and cruel whatever. Um, in reality that on, it only means like you can be ruthless and cruel if it enhances your government. If you're annoyed because your wife is happy because she's riding on a mule and you want to kill her and piss off her rich relations, that's not Machiavellian. So the fact that that this figure is described as Machiavellian frequently when this poem is discussed, I consider very inaccurate. Um, no. I don't fail people who say anything because that pisses them off and even though this is a topic for another video teaching is kind of a customer service job and so I need to not piss people off like I need to be Machiavellian and be diplomatic and make people like me even if I don't want to no no I don't get tenure I don't have a fucking PhD I don't get tenure Okay, let's not talk about tenure, because I don't know shit about tenure, because it's not something that's relevant to my life. People, people basically whore their asses out forever to get tenure, and I don't know, like, fortunately, I decided to take a path where that wasn't relevant to me, because I've seen how insane people get when that is an issue. Uh, but no, I don't fail people who say that. Sometimes I will give them a lower grade and give them comments being like, hey, have you considered this? Uh, but 
Um, literary analysis, as we're going to see as we move forward in this series, is not a cut and dry thing. You can basically make any claim you want in literary analysis as long as you give justifications for it. So if my students look like they're making an effort to back up their claim, I give them points for it. If they're just like, oh hey, the Duke is Machiavellian, I have nothing more to say, then I'm like, dude, fail. But if they're like, oh hey, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Even if they're making a quote, quote, correct claim and they don't support it, that still loses points because the whole thing is... Literary analysis, I know a lot of people think it's worthless, but literary analysis is supposed to teach you to think critically. And so you need to give reasons why you think that, which is kind of what I've tried to show in this video where I've said, okay, so this and this and this, and I've either quoted lines from the poem that support that, or I've brought in like my exterior historical knowledge to support it. Um, the whole thing, being a... Uh, a student or a professor of literature is kind of like being a lawyer in some ways. That you can make any claim you want to make, but you need to know the language and the rules of the debate structure, and you need to draw on those to support it. So if somebody was like, hey, I think the Duke is Machiavellian, and they gave a quote from the poem, I don't know what the fuck they would quote to support that. But if they gave a quote from the poem, even if I thought it was total bullshit, I would still give them credit for it because they're showing critical thinking. So that's about all I have for this. Mm -hmm. What? Yes. And that's the thing, like, when my students say something that I disagree with and I take points off for it, I always give them a comment that says, hey, have you considered this and this and this? And I cite things from the work that contradict what they're saying. Um, so, yeah, it's really all about looking at what's in the, in, in the work. And that's kind of what this series is going to be all about is how you look at a piece of literature in detail and stuff. So that's all for our first poem, but hopefully I will be back next month with more of this. Hopefully everybody enjoys. Till then, bye!